Good morning. And welcome to the Art, Resistance, and Responsibility panel discussion. Hello, my name is Rebecca Castillo. I am Columbia College 94 and School of Journalism 2006. And I am a member of the Fa Task Force Committee that helped plan this conference. Um, I have the honor of introducing this panel of illustrious alumni. Uh, we have Ro Roxana Alger Geffen, Columbia College 95, Sheila Nevins, Barnard College 60, Mabel, Mabel Wilson, Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, <laughs> uh, 91, and Christina Macaroli, Columbia College, 2010, and School of the Arts, 2013. She will be our moderator for, um, for this panel. And let me give you a little bit of background about Christina. She's a marketing and communications professional who has actively worked in the arts, education, and media sectors. And as of January 2018, she joined the college board as director of professional communications and marketing. And prior to that, she was director of marketing and communications at the World Science Festival. In today's discussion, you'll hear our speakers talk about how art and cultural resistance can challenge unjust systems and expand perceptions of reality, how artistic expression can empower individuals and communities, and what you can do to make a difference. I present our panel. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. So while we were thinking what would the art culture panel look like, we had to take into consideration that we are living in some very interesting times. <laughs> but that being said, if I've taken anything away from the conference so far, it's that we are the silver lining. We have the ability to make change. We have the ability to empower one another. And that's why I am so beyond thrilled to be sharing this stage with the group of women that joins me today. So I'm going to introduce each of them with a little bit more of an in-depth bio, and then we're going to begin. So sitting next to me, um, we're joined by Mabel Wilson, who teaches architectural design and history theory courses at Columbia GSAP. She's associate director at the Institute for Research in African American Studies and co-directs Global Africa Lab. Her design and scholarly research investigates space, politics, and cultural memory in black America, race and modern architecture, new technologies and the social production of space, and visual culture in contemporary art, film, and new media. Her transdisciplinary approach Practice Studio AND has been a competition finalist for several important cultural institutions, including Lower Manhattan's African Burial Ground Memorial and the Smithsonian's National Museum for African American History and Culture. Mabel is on the design team for the Memorial of Enslaved Laborers at UVA in Charlottesville. She is a founding member of Who Builds Your Architecture, an advocacy project to educate the architectural profession about problems of globalization and labor. She received her BS in architecture from the University of Virginia, Masters of Architecture at Columbia GSAP, and has a PhD in American Studies from New York University. Jeez. Sheila Nevins is president of HBO Documentary Films for Home Box Office, responsible for overseeing the development and production of all documentaries for HBO, HBO2, and Cinemax. As an executive producer or producer, she has received 32 Primetime Emmy Awards, 35 News and Documentary Emmys, and 42 George Foster Peabody Awards. During her tenure, HBO's critically acclaimed documentaries have gone on to win 26 Academy Awards. She has been honored with several prestigious career achievement awards, including the 2005 Emmy Lifetime Achievement Award for her contributions to the art of the documentary, and a personal Peabody in 1999 in recognition of her work and ongoing commitment to excellence. In 2002, the National Board of Review presented her with a humanitarian award for her contribution to the advancement of social reforms and the promotion of human welfare through film. She has supervised the production of more than 1,000 documentary programs for HBO and won the first George Foster Peabody Award ever presented to a cable program for She's Nobody's Baby, which was produced with Ms. Magazine. She is a New York Times best-selling author of You Don't you Look Your Age and Other Fairy Tales. <laughs> <laughs> Sheila holds an MBA from Barnard College and an MFA from Yale University School of Drama and Directing. 
Roxana Alger Geffen works with a variety of media and techniques, including painting, photography, textile art, and inspiration. She has an MFA in painting from Boston University. Now she is a resident artist at the Arlington Arts Center in Arlington, Virginia, and lives in DC with her husband and three children. She has shown her work in solo and group shows in DC, Virginia, New York, Boston, Vermont, Atlanta, and Denver, as well as in Wellington, New Zealand. Her work has been featured in a number of publications, most recently in the April issue of Sculpture Magazine, and is part of several private and corporate collections, including the District of Columbia's Council for the Arts and Humanities Washingtonia Collection and Capital One Bank. Could you all join me in a round of applause for this amazing group of women that joins me on stage? So I know that I speak for everyone when I say it is such a thrill that you're all here. Um, but before we embark on our conversation, I just have to point out what's so exciting about this conference is that it's bringing together both students and alumni. And for the benefit of the students in the room, I would love to start by asking what inspired you to get into your respective fields? And I'd like to go down the line. So Mabel, I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> um, wow, for me, it's, a, it's somewhat of a long story. I have a love-hate relationship with architecture, <laughs> um, which is why I have a degree in American studies and I do a lot of other things. Uh, um, I came from a creative family. Um, I have an uncle who's a well-known artist, but a number of artists in my family. Um, but just a general sense of African Americans as a kind of creative practice of making do with what you have. Um, you know, my grandmother was a domestic worker, but nonetheless was an amazing cook and could make anything out of anything. Um, and so I think there's a kind of sensibility that comes out of that family history that really impacted me. Architecture is a tough field because you know, there are not a lot of women in it, although I think the numbers are rising, and there are also not a lot of African Americans in it, very small number, and especially when you get to African American women, they're, they're very few, and I think it has to do with how, you know, the built environment's about wielding power and wealth. Um, so that's my love-hate relationship <laughs> to some respects, but I do think our built environment is where we live. It's where we dwell, uh, it's where we commune, it's, it's where we, where we imagine you know, who we are as a collective. And so I'm very much invested in thinking through and making um, an extraordinarily different environment. Thank you so much, Mabel. Sheila, what about you? You mean, why did I get my first job? Yes. I, I needed a job. <laughs> I have to say, in all honesty, um, I, you know, my father was a post office clerk and a sort of bookie at night. Um, that's why to this day I can't believe that the mail arrives on time. <laughs> but um, and um, I, I needed a job. I had graduated from Barnard and majored in English, graduated from Yale, majored in directing. But it was 1963. I'm actually 100 today. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and uh, I, I, um, I needed a job. And I wanted to work in theater, but I couldn't because my very first husband, not my current lovely husband, but my first, wanted me home in the evening and wanted me home on weekends. And I thought in 1963 that that was my job and that was what I was supposed to do. And so the only thing open to me was really television because I could get a day job. And the only day jobs in television that were w available were either on camera, which I didn't want to do, or um, basically you know, a PA job or whatever. And, but it was contained in the sense that you could work from nine to nine and have a life and you probably weren't gonna work on weekends. So I, I would like to say that I wanted to change the world, but really I wanted to move out of my mother's apartment and I wanted to have my own apartment and I wanted a job and there were jobs making documentaries and news and in television and so I took them. Then I changed the world. <laughs> 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 Roxana, how about you? Uh, I became an artist because I became resigned to the fact that I couldn't do anything else. Um, I tried to do other things for many years. I tried to circle around becoming a fine artist. I was a graphic designer. I was an interior designer. I taught children art. I worked on as a PA on a television show. I built sets for FAO Schwartz. I did a number of different things, but finally resigned myself to the fact that, in fact, I couldn't resist anymore the pull of, of being by myself in my studio and making my own work. Um, my mother is a fiction writer, so I had a great example of sort of it being possible to have a, 
uh, creative career. And so it seemed, certainly seemed possible uh, to do that. And yeah. Great. Thank you all. So I'm going to open with a very large question, and I'm going to put Mabel on the spot again. <laughs> and then we'll where see where <laughs> conversation <laughs> flows. I, I got to earn my salary. <laughs> a buffer so, to the next one. What do you think the role of art and culture in our society should be mm. today? Yeah, yeah I, actually, I wanted to start, and I had to pull this up because I can't remember exactly, but this is a quote my colleague Mario Gooden likes to use. Um, quote, this is precisely the time when artists go to, work, go to work. No need for silence, no room for fear. And that's Toni Morrison. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that that... You know, I think that really sums it up. I think you know our respective fields and a lot of others, literature, um, theater, c creative activities allow you to see the world differently. That it's, a, it's a lens that allows you to see sort of where you are, what's going on in the world, but amplified, transformed. Um, and, and I think there's a critical role today for artists that can, you know, the artistic work that can enlighten. Um, and I think creativity is absolutely important for change. You have to create change. It doesn't just happen. And you have to be able to imagine, imagine what that, that might be. And so I think creative work really does become the lens through which you can actually um, begin to engage those possibilities. I think that's very true. Do either of you? Have a response well, or build I, I on that? I think that the, the warning that I would issue is that the creative work has to reach the population you're trying to change. That if there's elitism or an expense involved um, that doesn't allow the population to get in to see the need for change, you could wind up, and you do wind up, with someone like a Trump who knows how to manipulate everyday experience into cause. So it would seem to me that, that it's very important, and maybe that's why I'm so in love with television and social networking and all that, because I think that you don't have to pay to enter usually, and you can reach the surprise person who thought they hated you, uh, you know, an hour ago or an hour and a half ago or never thought of that thought. And so I'm sort of a, a proletariat when it comes to change. Um, my favorite playwrights are people like Arthur Miller and Clifford Odets and Bertolt Brecht, who really cost 75 cents or a dollar to, to hear that the world was in trouble. Um, so I, I guess you know that's sort of what I, I think is the dilemma and the warning of art for change, which is access. I um, think you bring up an excellent point. I know, having been in school, uh, a debate that we would often have is, well, what, I what is good art versus bad art? And if it has mass appeal, well, it can't be very good because it has mass appeal. Um, but I think we're living in a time where that has, that has to be untrue in order to make a difference and make things that move forward. I think part of, part of, the, 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 part of the, the problem is that that's a sort of, pr I, to me, that seems like a problematic uh, way to think about art mm -hmm. in terms of good or bad, in terms of mass appeal or a sort of a, a, a high aesthetic that's only accessible to some people. I mean, to me, um, it's better to think about work as being successful or not successful. And to me, an artwork is successful because it communicates something effectively with the viewer. And I think. Lots of things communicate with the viewer. I mean, advertising communicates with the viewer, and propaganda communicates with the viewer. But I think where art can step in is it has it offers a kind of true communication with the viewer in the sense that it it has a complexity that allows for a response from the viewer. It's not telling the viewer something. It's it's opening the conversation about something, and it may have a point of view, but it it permits the viewer to come back with a rebuttal or a response somehow. It engages the viewer in that way. And so work can have a mass appeal or a limited appeal, but as long as it's successfully communicating, then I think, uh, I mean, I agree. The issue of access is, I think, a little bit separate. But as, as, a, as somebody who's making art, um, that's not always in my control. I mean, obviously, I can look for opportunities. And in fact, 
the, the reason I'm here is the body of work I did. I was disseminated through Instagram. So I agree completely about the sort of um, using um, democratic ways of accessing and, and communicating with everybody, but um, of course. But at the same time, I think it's important for the artist to be focused on trying to let the piece communicate as successfully as possible and not necessarily be um, trying to uh, trying to actively dictate. Because in some ways, to me, um, that also reinforces this kind of autocratic perspective. Um, and I think good work, because it involves this communication, is, is uh, it does do sort of what Mabel was suggesting in terms of allowing people to see a different point of view in a way that doesn't make them feel uh, that their point of view has been negated. So. All excellent points. And something that came up in a lot of the pre-phone calls that I had with the three of you is in line with this, that sometimes intent doesn't necessarily match outcome. And sometimes there's actually a beauty in finding an outcome in a work that you didn't expect. Uh, Sheila, I'm going to put the spotlight on you because you told me a very interesting story about a letter that you received in this response is when to people wrote letters. When people was. wrote letters <laughs> to one of your documentaries that I think speaks to this issue beautifully, and I would love it if you would share it with the group. Well, I saw uh, Obit. I get a lot of ideas from Obits. I don't know why. It's just my dark self, I guess. But I saw an Obit many, many years ago when the AIDS epidemic had begun. And it was about a doctor named Peter who lived in Vancouver who did a nightly show and the obit said that he had done 65 shows to his death. And it was to make people less afraid of people who had uh, HIV and ultimately at that time in our history, um, necessity, the necessity to, for it to develop into AIDS. And Dr. Peter um, did these shows in Vancouver and I just read this in an obit and then I called the television station where he did these and um, he was long dead. And I met with the producer, and we basically did, or edited down to an hour and a half, and then even shorter, actually, because we're limited by television and what time allows. Anyway, we had edited it down to about, I don't know, eventually about an hour and then even shorter, but that's beside the point. Um, I thought it was about allowing your coworkers not to be afraid of someone who was HIV positive at the time, that you could not, you would not transmit this disease, this virus, by being friendly, by being helpful, by, you know, you know, I don't know, having them as your assistants or your secretary or subjects or sitting in a restaurant. There was a paranoia going on in the city at that time that was really impossible. And um, I thought Dr. Peter would quell that and this show would quell it. And it had a very strange, opposite reaction. Not that it made people afraid, but I had gotten a letter, which I told you about, from an army, uh, what's higher, sergeant or corporal? I don't know much about the army. Sorry, thank you. Um, from an army sergeant, a handwritten letter that said, I watched your documentary about Dr. Peter. I've always hated gay men. I've always hated them in the army. I've never wanted to be near them. It had nothing to do with HIV. It had nothing to do with AIDS. It had to do with gay men in the army. And he said, I'm ashamed of myself. I consider myself a religious, caring person, and um, I'm not. I fight for our country, but I'm not fighting for my fellow man. And I was, you know, I ran up and down the halls of HBO because, you know, it wasn't something you could send by email anymore. But I, I, there was where the result and the intent were, you know, I thought to myself, what did I do? I didn't, <laughs> I, I wasn't talking to him. I didn't even know he subscribed. So it is the, the gratitude you get sometimes from, um, or the, the lesson you learn sometimes from just a good-hearted, open approach to a storytelling that has ramifications way beyond what you might have thought, sometimes the other way, but very often in a positive way, a sort of nudging the world in a way you never thought of before. And that's the joy of, of, you know, making cause documentaries. Um, doesn't happen all the time. If you want to write to me, it's fine. <laughs> but it's, you know, it is the gift. 
that okay? <laughs> that was wonderful. Okay. <laughs> uh, Mabel, in, in your work, you're, you're not only transmitting a message, but you're inviting people into a space. Uh, how have you seen intent and outcome come into play? Um, well, I mean, design processes are, are notoriously not controllable <laughs> in terms of, um, do, it's interesting because I work, you know, I work as a designer, um, but I also work as a scholar, as a historian. So when I do my scholarly work, I can be obsessively in control of every single little minutia of what I'm writing. You know, and then on the other side, when you do design work, it's very collaborative, right? And, and, and I actually enjoy that. Um, but not only the, the, the immediate group that you're collaborating with, your team or, um, you know, the various, but, but there's a whole public that's out there that's, that's engaging. Um, but what's remarkable um, is that you have to be really open. And again, I mean, it's about creativity. It's about um, being open to the unexpected. And that's precisely, I think, the creative ethos. And so, for example, when we've been working on this uh, memorial for enslaved laborers at UVA, um, the university had a contentious relationship with the African American community in Charlottesville for, for decades, if not you know, well over a century. And these were the descendants of the enslaved that worked at the university that the university said kind of weren't there. Um, so now that they've been sort of, the university recognizes it has to own its history, you know, this memorial in some part had to happen with a rich dialogue with that community. And so we had to sort of actively create those links and open, open that dialogue up. And it took a lot of people to do it, and it really was a communal effort. But it was remarkable, I think, for what we learned and, and also how I began to understood just the history of what slavery does within a small community and the aftermath of slavery, essentially, on people's lives. Um, and, but, but nonetheless, we had to be able to open up that forum. We had to be open to, OK, maybe people didn't want to talk to us. And if they didn't, how are we going to work around that? And so, you know, so it's constantly calibrating how you work to the situations that you find yourself in. So I think that's actually important to, to just the creative process. Thank you, Mabel. I would actually like to use that as a segue to talk a little bit about your piece, Roxana, oh, The Descent Callers. The Descent Callers. Um, and maybe you could give everyone here an introduction to what they are if they haven't seen them, and uh, maybe why they tie into some themes for today. Yeah, <laughs> so um, I, uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm uh, the day after the, so I, I live in D.C. Um, I, uh, my husband worked in the White House briefly for President Obama. It was a tremendous honor for all of us. And I canvassed for Obama both times, and then I canvassed for Hillary. And um, as I'm sure, I, I'm sure I'm not the only person who felt just utterly um, flattened and, and despairing when after the election. And um, I saw a news item. Uh, a couple, a week after, or something like that, that was just a couple of lines saying that Justice Ginsburg, who will be giving the keynote, um, had worn her dissent collar the day after the election, which is, for those of you who don't know, she has lots of different collars that she wears with her judicial robes. And um, she has one collar that she wears when she's reading a dissenting opinion. And she, it, many of the collars are sort of lace, and they're, they're, these lace jabots, she calls them, and they're these sort of frothy and delicate and, and all white. And then the descent collar is um, brown and has some sort of gems, you know, semi-precious stones in it, and it, it's, it's, it's um, more sort of architectural in its form and more sturdy. And so she said, you know, it, and I, I then, of course, looked it up, and it, there's a, an interview where she's holding it up and saying, this looks like it's a descent. It looks powerful. Mm -hmm. So she wore that. And so she wore it as a political statement the day after the election. Um, and I just saw those two lines, and I was um, really, really struck by it. I mean, for one thing, my work in general is about contradiction. I'm always drawn to putting contradictory things together and sort of making them fight it out, basically, material-wise. Um, so that interested me. And it interested me that she, who's uh, a great intellectual presence and a presence not known for her appearance, particularly, um, was using this sort of more feminine uh, gesture 
to make a very profound intellectual uh, statement. But also, and I only kind of really put this together when I was thinking about what I, this panel and some of these questions, um, she used it to break the rules because she actually was censured for this, not by in some quarters, because she's not supposed to be political. Um, and also, I think she had given the finger about Donald Trump recently <laughs> before this. So I think her, her views were already known. But um, but she and she was she used it as a way to be to make her views visible. Um, and after the election, I really felt um, just heartbroken, and I had sort of I had participated as a citizen um, and in uh, you know many ways to, to, to sort of continuing this change that had come about with President Obama and that I found so powerful and moving and so I was I just felt despairing like I, I had I had done the, the right I'd been the good girl I had I had gone out and I had canvassed and I had followed the rules and I'd done all the things you're supposed to do as a citizen and it had come it you know this huge fissure this in our landscape national landscape had been had opened up even wider and deeper than i had realized it had been and could be and um so i wanted and then you know on facebook and social media and among our friends in dc it was just we were all saying the same things to each other and it that didn't seem our words <coughs> didn't seem to be particularly useful either so i started making these necklaces and posting pictures of myself wearing them on Instagram and saying these are my descent collars. Um, and they're not, they're not particularly, this is not one of them, this is an actual necklace made by, <clears throat> um, but they're, because mine are made out of Swiffer pads and rubber bands and earplugs and it's, I mean they have some jewelry components too, but they're often uncomfortable or uh, very sort of ephemeral and um, I, I had initially said, rashly that I would make one for every day that um, Donald Trump was president, but um, that didn't happen. <laughs> I really hoped it would be a much shorter tenure, um, <laughs> sadly. So, and also because as I got involved with the project, um, the, 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 the objects themselves got more and more complex, and then they eventually became sort of breastplates, and then they turned into dresses, and now I've sort of expanded it, and they've sort of changing in a different direction, and they're going to be these uh, cloaks, but um, it was about and so I've I've shown this work a number of times and there's a sort of it's grown in dimensions. But um, it was about showing how I felt this combination of being despairing and um, also preparing to fight. I mean, collars themselves are quite quite contradictory in nature. They're both um, protection for our kind of vulnerable necks, but also very involved with um, uh, control and domination in all sorts of really unpleasant or, I don't know, depending, I guess, on your sexual preferences, possibly pleasant ways. But, um, <laughs> but they're, they're not, they're not uh, unambiguous, and especially to be a woman posting pictures of myself on um, on Instagram, you know, I would find that I would get more likes if I was wearing lipstick in these pictures, even though uh, people were saying, you know, yes, it's great that you're out there, you know, uh, dissenting publicly. Um, but it was also for me about my powerlessness because um, I just felt, you know, as a white woman, we had failed. We had we had failed our country somehow. We had not done what we needed to do to make this not happen. And I felt powerless and frustrated and despairing. And so the work is also about that. It's about, you know, well, all I can do is make jewelry and wear it. That seems like a really minimal statement and gesture. So, um, so it was a combination of things, but I think it was primarily about being seen um, and and somehow sending that radar blip out into the world that you know um, this wasn't the world that I wanted it to be, I guess. So I think failure is something that's so key to bring up when thinking about art in general, because um, at least in in my experience, there 
some great things can come from that um, when it drives you in particular ways. And I think that the next generation of creators is constantly thinking about how are, how are we not only going to react to situations at hand, but how are we going to take what some may deem as a failure and be proactive about what it is that we're putting out in the world. So turning back to all of you, and Sheila, I'm going to put you on the spot to kick this off. You mentioned to me that you are um, going to be leaving HBO in March. Mm -hmm. So what is your hope for the next generation who is going to be you continuing think I'm dying? to work? Is that no, what you're doing? No, no. You, but you're, you're, um, I'm leaving you're, HBO. I'm not leaving the planet. No, but you're, 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 a, you're, a men, you're a mentoring figure. You're continuing to work. Um, and I'm a disagreeable more. mentoring figure. <laughs> Um, I was thinking um, that I would love to wear one of your necklaces, but then I was wondering if the 42% that support Trump are going to buy these necklaces. Mm -hmm. So I can't help but think, wherever I am, in or out of you know, the office or wherever I am in the field, um, that there are two kinds of expression. There's the personal expression, which is beautiful and artistic, and I'm not that. And then there's the, pr the, the expression of nudging and pushing change. And uh, you can only nudge and push change from where I have sat in public, sort of trying to please the public, um, by attacking the enemy, not what I think, but what they wrongly, or what I believe they wrongly think. So I keep thinking about, you know, how would I get those necklaces to that 42%? Mm -hmm. What would I do? How would I tell that story? when, you know, it's just a very complex idea about change. When you talk about Charleston, what a great place to be able to, to do what you're doing mm -hmm. because you have the war there, you know, and so you have the two sides observing this cry from the past. That intrigues me. I don't, I don't really know the answer to any of these mm -hmm. questions other than there is a dilemma between artistic expression and communication, mm -hmm. and uh, communication for change, social change. So in a sense, the panel and what we're talking about is uh, of great interest and great controversy because um, there is the artist and then there is the social climate that needs to be nudged and the artist that needs to express themselves. And when they cross over, it's quite extraordinary and it's very difficult. And um, you know, it's just an interesting dilemma. Um, and Mabel, one of your um, many projects is the fact that you are a professor and you're working with the next generation of architects. So how are you working with them to walk that line that mm. Sheila's talking about? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I'm actually teaching a, s a studio at um, uh, UC Berkeley and um, the studio is called Bodies of Assembly, and we're looking at what does it mean to assemble, literally assemble bodies in public space, and they're studying protests, uh, and they have to make an assembly hall. So the architecture that first begins to say, okay, what happens when you begin to concretize those relationships in a space to engage in critical public debate? Um, but I asked them to make a body assembly, the person I'm teaching with, Jason and I, and they were incredibly brilliant, like a, an apparatus that brought two bodies together. Like one group made, um, it was a sheath that had an arm and an extra pad that you could sit down and invite someone to sit next to you and have yeah. their <laughs> arm around you. <laughs> 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 it was brilliant in terms of how it forced people to engage, questions of comfort and proximity, and, and they tested it out on campus. They also went into the BART system, which is the subway, and you know, it was absolutely spot on in terms of that. Another group, w we're working with um, iPhones, right? This idea that we're always like this, but what happens if you actually have to depend on someone to tell you where to go through this apparatus that we're always, so they, they did FaceTime. One person was looking at another person's view. That other person had to tell you where to walk based on what they were seeing. They weren't there, your body wasn't there, but you were right. seeing it. <laughs> You know, and that constant negotiation, but ultimately we realized it was about trust, right? Yeah. So each of these projects, on a very kind of micro level, the students were sort of engaging in, I think, these very big political issues. So, so I think it's possible. I mean, I think it's possible in, in, you know, in, in the next generation to really start to get them to see that in their work, these questions are, are already there and that they can start to bring this through as they, as they begin to, to, to practice, right? 
so. Well, I can't believe it, but it's already time for our Q&A session. <laughs> That flew by. So we have a microphone that's going to be working its way around the room. Um, if you can ask the question into the mic and also state your name and what school you're affiliated with. That would be great. So opening it to the floor. This is right here. Hi. Um, thank you very much for your time. Um, my name is Marina Blitchstein. I was School of the Arts uh, in 2012. Um, I'm interested as like a, someone who identifies as a feminist poet and writer. I'm really troubled by like who I'm writing to, who my yeah. audience is, because I always secretly wanted to be women. But uh, at the same time, like I, I'm worried about you know, male criticism and um, whether or not I could reach out to um, men to see us as human beings. Um, so I wonder if you could speak a bit to that, like who, who, who we're making art for, and like should it be, um, should it be the like majority, um, and should it be like an oppressive body? I guess. I would just want to say one thing, which is that I have a daughter, but I also have two sons. And my older son walks around as much as he will let, we will let him without, he doesn't want to take it off to wash it. But he wears a sweatshirt <laughs> that on the back says, the future is female. And he is an ardent feminist. So I, I feel really strongly that we need to bring men into we can't suggest i mean it, it, it's it's equally false to say that all men are incapable of of behaving the way we you know with res treating women with respect and equality um i think the system is deeply flawed and i think many men don't understand how how to not work they don't recognize the system and they don't know how to behave um, otherwise, but I also think it's a, it's deeply problematic to suggest that they're they can't hear your voice. Um, so I, uh, on the other hand, I don't know your work, and I don't would know who what kind of work you're making, and you should. But I think you should sort of write the work that you need to write, and not worry about your audience. But I also think that um, if your work communicates your feelings strongly, then everybody can be moved by it. Um, and I. I don't know, that's what. Do we have any more questions in the room? In the front. Hi, how are you? Thank you, everyone. I have a little cold, sorry, but try to communicate. Uh, I'm Jen, I was SOA in 2009 um, for directing. Um, so a question for you. You talked about the magic of expression when it meets the ability to get out into the world. Do you feel like there's a paradox there? I mean, you, you talked about how it's rare, um, but I feel like there's also a paradox there sometimes. Um, we like to believe that if we create something moving that the entire world will embrace it, but often it feels like it's niche or um, exclusionary because of you know gender or race or any of religion expectations. Um, can you speak to that at all? How to well, deal I mean, with it? I mean, it's the dilemma, isn't it? It's the dilemma between personal expression, social change, and art, I don't know the answer really. I think it's a wrestle. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, for me personally, if you're communicating in a closet, you're not communicating at all. But that's my particular thing. I can enter that closet and want to wear it, want to buy it, buy it for someone. But I know in my heart, I haven't opened the door. So I would say, you know. Isn't open the door what we're talking about here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I steal <laughs> ideas from wherever I can, yeah. That's what you do in television. You just, you know, snap it right up. I would say it's a closed door if you're talking to yourself. And that's fine. It can be great beauty. Um, you know, I don't know if when Michelangelo made the statue of David, he thought it would be the greatest statue in the world. I don't really know. Maybe he did it for himself. Maybe he thought it was the most beautiful man he'd ever seen. I don't know the answer. Somehow the door opens and I don't really know. I've always liked mediums that the door is open because of its accessibility. But that, you know, it's a good question you asked. And I said, you know, I can't help you. <laughs> mm 
Hi, my name is Laura. I'm also from the School of the Arts in <laughs> 2004. Um, sort of related to that, I know that uh, it's hard to ask how do you reach the audiences maybe that you wish were watching you. And I'm curious to come at it from another, another angle. Um, is there something that you didn't create, something that maybe you can give an example of that you experienced that another artist created that sort of surprised you and somehow reached you in a way that you didn't expect? Uh, that could help us figure out how that happens. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I think that was for me. Oh, wow. <laughs> I am work. assigning you that question. Oh, gosh. <laughs> My brain is dead. Um, wow, I'm trying to think, what have I, like, what have I seen recently? Um, yeah, I saw the work of an artist. I went to the Venice Biennale, Art Biennale, actually, recently, and the work of an artist named Sam Shea who was an undocumented worker who was here, he was a conceptual artist, he was here in Manhattan, I think in the 70s and 80s, and he had an obsessive practice where he would just do something religiously for a year, that was his project. And one of his projects was he would live outside for a year, like he would not go into a building for a year, and he would document what did it mean to have to defecate in public, what did it mean to sleep outside, what did it mean when you didn't have a resource of money, but you somehow had to find a way to eat, like he, you know, he had a very limited budget, and, and I thought it was profoundly revealing about how our lives are structured by institutions, by governments, by our social class, by... Um, and I, I thought his work was incredibly powerful. I've assigned it to students, actually, to look at because I think both the rigor of his practice and his discipline, his mode of documentation, I think is absolutely fascinating, but also what it reveals about the structures that enable the world in which we live in that we're often oblivious to, right? Because I think one of the things that I see every time I see Trump and his administration, this is patriarchy. They don't give a damn about women, gender, sexuality, race. Yeah, I mean, like, everything is just out there. This is about power. Um, and it's raw, but we have to understand it isn't just this group of people, but it's institutionalized. Mm -hmm. And how do we change the institution so that, you know, this doesn't happen again, that people don't feel emboldened or have access to this kind of power? You know, like, what would a government run by women actually look like? Uh -huh. Whether you're conservative or liberal, I think it would be very different, actually. So, and not to say that it's gender, you know, necessarily gender specific, because I think you're right. Men can be feminist, right? Uh, women can be patriarchs. But I do think we need to really challenge those institutions, because that's what's allowing this to happen. Hi, um, my question uh, is about. I was at the um, an incomplete history of protest at the uh, Whitney. And I, what, I, what I was struck by there is they, the Whitney dedicated a whole case um, to letters to the Whitney Museum from the archives about how a protest of the Whitney over the years. Um, and it was, I'm not sure it was an, an admission of, of a mistake that the Whitney was exposing or um, they wanted to show their growth over the years, but they really, you know, aired some of their dirty laundry about how they didn't do the right thing over the years. And I wanted to see if any of you had, in your art, in your work, have you ever done anything like that, where you um, maybe took responsibility for something? I mean, life is complicated, and you know, people are complex. And so I just wanted to see if, if that, if you'd ever done anything similar. What were the criticisms in the letters? You, I, I knew somebody was going to ask me that. My memory is so <laughs> bad. But I'm so a panelist. I'm not just somebody. Yeah, no. no. <laughs> I, I can't remember. I, I, I think it was something to do with women artists and that at the time it would, they did not have enough women artists on and display. And African American Whitney. artists. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. I, the letters I read, there was a big case of letters there. Um, and, uh, you know, amidst all the posters on the wall, they had right. they had letters of protest to the Whitney, hmm. um, and I thought it was great that they did that. What was the question? The question is: Have have in your projects in in your work have you ever have you ever done something like that too? You mean written the letters or no, read the letters? No, conveyed a. Um, not an not an admission of a mistake, but conveyed the fact that, you know, you might have had a growing experience too. I'm not sure I can answer that. Can you? Can you? My 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 current project actually is about um, 
the history of my family in the United States, and my family has been here since the very beginning. I'm like a wasp, the er wasp. Um, so I, my fit, my work now is about sort of. Um, uh, looking at the way that my family has participated in um, participated in slavery, participated in abolition. Actually, I have some abolitionists, some very um, prominent abolitionists, abolitionists in my family. So that, but it's um, I'm so I'm sort of looking at at the history of of how um, the the inherent privilege of my of my ancestors have handed down to me and how how that positions me in in our country now yeah and this will be our last question hi I'm Jennifer Freitag uh, law school 1991 um, I'm wondering with the um, the me too movement and all the attention that's that's come lately um, of people who have not behaved well. Um, there has been some debate I've seen in the press about if someone is an artist, um, and I think one of the museums, is, at first I thought that's what the other woman was going to address, um, has been questioning whether they should continue to show certain artists' work as it's come out um, that they've abused women. And I'm just wondering how you all feel as artists about if someone has created important work but they're not we now know maybe perhaps not a good human being. Um, how should that be handled in terms of viewing the art and having it available uh, in the future? Uh. <laughs> I think it's, it's complicated, obviously. I think it's a case by case, but I also think there's always something to learn about, you know, that people write about particular artists, um, you know, historically in, in, in various ways, and I think it's always, an opportunity to come back and re-examine and, and question um, someone's work and, and what they've contributed. Um, but are you going to like paint over Guernica because Picasso was slightly yeah. abusive? Are you going to um, take down the statue of David because Michelangelo clearly liked young boys? That doesn't mean he touched them or, or manipulated them or did anything wrong. But in other words, I'm very confused about this issue. Uh, the Woody Allen thing has just blown my head off because I could argue both sides of it. Mm -hmm. And that really disturbs me that I'm, because I, I usually know what I think, but I'm not sure what I think. The statues that are covered from the Civil War in Charleston, I mean, I, I don't really know. I mean, I don't want to be out of touch with people who believe differently from the way I do. On the other hand, I don't want them to believe the way they believe because I think it's detrimental to moving forward. But I, I think it's a real dilemma for our time. Does art stand alone or just, you know? I mean, I don't know. I don't know. We lose senators. We lose artists. Um, we lose their art. Um, I, I really don't know. I, I, and I'm obsessed with the Rosa McGowan and the mm -hmm. fact that her manager committed suicide and I, it was bipolar and, I, you know, I'm so confused. Yeah. I don't really know. I don't want to go to a museum right now until I figure it out. Yeah. So I might just stay here for the week. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. I thought we ended at noon. We actually ended at 12.15, so we have plenty of time for questions. Next question. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Antoinette Bumekpour, and I'm currently um, a student at the School of Arts, MFA Poetry. And in taking on being a full-time artist, how is it that you all continue to generate um, inspiration, direction, keep, you know, keep things in flow. And I know you said you look at obituaries often. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll take that one. Okay. I guess that'll be something I'll be remembered for. <laughs> I know one I won't be looking at. <laughs> Is that a question for me? Okay, you go. Um, I okay, you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I would just say I take it from everything. I mean, I, I feel like you have to sort of try to maintain a, a sense of engagement with the world. Uh, I just, I try to keep my eyes open all the time. Um, mm -hmm. But I have made a whole body of work about Minecraft, which is a computer game yeah, that I yeah. learned about from my kids. Um, I, I, I try to 
be an omnivore, I think, is also a part of it. I try to not not look a gift horse in the mouth in the mouth. Anything that sparks I, I guess what I would say is I've learned to follow the spark of interest, even if it's in something that I wouldn't have expected to be interested in. And I have learned to be very zealous in my response to any time something seems kind of catches my attention and I think, oh wait, why? Wait, oh, is but is that interesting? Wait, wait well maybe it is interesting. Well, and then researching it or looking at it or following it or whatever, um, I've learned to be um, active in my in my hunting down of, you know, something that sparks something in myself, I guess. Yeah, I would absolutely agree. It's just the spark. I, there's a really great essay by a neuroscientist that teaches at NYU, and it's about why he takes his students to see um, Terrell's um, Skyroom at PS1 uh -huh. every year. And mm -hmm. part of it is just to get them, you know, to kind of think, be outside, literally outside the box, but also that the importance of creativity for um, the sciences um, as well. Um, you know, and the fact that it's really the hmm, you know, he says hmm moment, not the aha, but the hmm, why is that the way it is? That is the thing that exactly sparks curiosity, and that's what you really have to follow. And, you know, I think you can find that in so many different ways that then just, you know, spur on your, your practice. Like I did, um, I've been obsessed with genealogy for a while. I mean, same thing, like <laughs> family histories. Uh, did my uh, um, ancestry DNA and also did 23andMe. You know, and I, I, I'm kind you of did? like now obsessed. Yeah, I'm yeah, completely obsessed with the story that's now piecing, being pieced together about who I am as an American. Um, and I don't know what I'm gonna do. Am I gonna make an artwork about this, a video piece? Am I gonna, you know, do a curatorial project, perform? I mean, you know, I, you know it just, it can spark so much in your own practice. I, I did my dog's DNA. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Was I mean, he also descended from Charlemagne? No, <laughs> no, he's a mutt from Atlanta. Uh. And um, it was very interesting because you just take a swab um, of you, you know your dog's uh, saliva. Thank you. It's such a hard word for me. And um, so from the obit to saliva, I'm really a very <laughs> dark person. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, and I sent it. And you send it for $75, and then they send you back what your dog is made of. But what was interesting, getting back to the elitism and the regular guy, um, in Connecticut, where I go sometimes, and you know when I walk around my dog, they say, oh, he's a mutt, he's so cute. On the Upper East Side of New York, people say to me, Oh, he's a designer dog, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> and I was just thinking as we were all talking, you know, that is the dilemma, isn't what's, it? What's a designer dog? <laughs> a designer dog is a labradoodle, <laughs> where you take a lab and a poodle and you put them together and you get a labradoodle. So it turned out his DNA was um, poodle, um, what was the other one I put? Bichon, Bichon, and 5% terrier. And then they sent a picture of what he would look like based on his saliva, and it looked like Bogey, right? <laughs> it looked just like him. So the thing was, um, I'm afraid to send my ancestry thing. <laughs> 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 I'd like to be, you know, a designer dog on the Upper East Side, <laughs> and in and in We're Connecticut, designer, <laughs> a designer person. <laughs> I don't know. Um, do you have any more questions? <laughs> yeah. Hi, uh, from the Hawaii School of Arts. Um, I uh, graduated in, the, in May. I'm, I'm a short story writer. Um, mm. And I, um, I have a full-time job as a lawyer. I have three children under the age of six. Oh and um, every day, <laughs> <laughs> I, I know that my calling is to write these amazing short stories to help change the world. And I, every day, I wake up with this huge stress that I only really have, like, 20 to 30 minutes at most to work on them right now. So um, I'm wondering what advice you have um, to an artist who has all of these other responsibilities um, in how to navigate that. So I, I, I really mean it when I applauded you because you know that you're you're doing about 14 different jobs simultaneously, and it's 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 very impressive. Um, I guess I would say I've, I've been in very similar circumstances. I also have three children. Um, I would say a couple things. One is just that 
as they get older, it gets easier. So no, it doesn't. <laughs> I, think, I think in terms of the under six, the amount oh, of maybe under active six. Well, you don't need pampers anymore, but it gets emotionally more. Uh, other things are, go are more complicated, okay. but they're not, but the, that, that sense of all of your, t every second of your time being taken by, you know, each step of their day, lessons is really what I mean. Um, so, um, so it's, there is a light at the end of the tunnel in terms of your mind, your mental space, and your time being a little bit more open. I would say that when I was working, I took some time off from the studio, sort of, um, when my children were little, or I, I, I sort of lessened my expectations for myself in the studio. But um, I got, when I came back to it, I, I did get to be very efficient. And I, I sort of equate it with, uh, meditating if you've ever I don't know if you've ever practiced meditation but that similar sense of sort of how quickly can you get your mind into that creative state and mm -hmm. I got much much better at it when I had much less time um, but the other thing I learned was and thanks to my husband actually who was really helpful in this uh, is to be selfish um, and to to demand of yourself and of your family and of your job some time to do what you need to do um, and to not, your children will happily suck you dry because um, that's what they're designed to do, but they're also okay if you don't give them all of yourself. And so it's really important to stake your claim mentally and emotionally that this is, is, is vital, crucial time and emotional space and mental space for your own work um, and to guard it with a lot of ferocity. <laughs> so that would be my advice. Mm -hmm. Do we have the mic in the background? But you already asked a question. I know, I did, but I, this is a question that you might find very easy or very hard. But um, I'm dutifully going back to the what this is about, which is responsibility and resistance. So um, maybe it's a fun question, it's for all of you. Um, if you had no budgetary issues, no time issues, um, you could reach everyone. Access was not a problem, but you had one shot. What would, you, what would you resist? What would you do with that shot to reach everybody with one, one work or one action? What do you think is the most important thing to resist? What do you feel most responsibility to resist? And how would you do it? I mean, you know, as much as you can answer that in like three, three minutes. God. That's a big question. <laughs> yeah, it's almost hard to, yeah, it's hard to imagine. I mean, I just feel like for me, it's, it's not about the big one thing, it's about my practice. It's the everyday set of relationships that I have to constantly cultivate, whether it's with my students or collaborators or some agency or wh whomever. Like that's the, you know, like the constant push in, in the work. And so I can't imagine having this smooth terrain in which <laughs> I could just put it out there. Because I actually think in, yeah, I just think in, it's exactly in the formation of those relationships that then allow you to get your message across as well. Mm -hmm. So it isn't just in the thing. And I found that to be really, really, really helpful, actually. Um, so just in my own work. So you all mentioned Trump, so it's like, this, this is, is that what we should be resisting right now? Or is it Me Too? Or is it women's and race? Why? That's more, yeah. I guess, what I'm I think when you resist Trump, you're doing all those things. Yeah. <laughs> So I think it becomes a metaphor for resistance. But I was looking at the name on the outside of the door, and it's um, this is the Jed D. Satow room. And I couldn't figure out why. I mean, I, you know, I never know where I'm going. I just look, and I go where it says. Um, and uh, we're working on a film on suicide and trying to help kids, because with young people, it's often a very impetuous act. And if they can just wait or get some help or maybe even medicine of some kind, they can live. Jed did not live. And when I saw his name, I was startled because I thought, oh, that's why I'm here because I thought it was because of Barnard. I, didn't, I, I really didn't know. But I was thinking about Jed and I was thinking about the film we were doing and I got sort of emotional while I was listening because I realized that in the, in the sign on the door is the reason that I will work very hard 
the next year outside of HBO because I'm doing it outside of HBO um, to make kids wait and think and care. Um, and I guess that's why we're all here, which is to make people think and wait and care and understand that it doesn't have to match you to need your help. It doesn't have to look like you to need your help. And that you can make a difference, whatever it is, with a paintbrush, with words, or whatever. Um, I don't know exactly how you find that private time. I'm not good at meditation, clearly, um, or private moments. But I think you just wrestle life to get your message out, whatever it is. But there's Jed on the door. He died at Cornell as, a, as 19 years ago, actually. And his mother formed something called the Jed Foundation. And uh, we got involved in that. And we're making a film. And... Um, you know, I guess that's why we're all here, because some sign on some door tells you to do something. And I think that's the perfect way to wrap it up. Oh, my God. <laughs> 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 you couldn't have even planned that. Thank you all for attending. Thank you.